Chapter 19. Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than he who is perverse in speech and is a fool. Amen to that. Verse 2. Also, it is not good for a person to be without knowledge, and he who hurries his footsteps errs, or literally, sins. You know how fools rush in where angels fear to tread? Fools rush in and sin immediately. That's probably a better way to put that. Verse 3, the foolishness of man ruins his way, and his heart rages against the Lord. I think one of the clearest lessons that I have learned in the last seven and a half years with this church fellowship is God takes His time. He just takes His time. He is not hurried. He is not in a rush to get things done. He doesn't push. He doesn't strive. He doesn't freak out. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has made everything appropriate in its time. He's also said eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. He's he's put eternity in our heart, but then he requires faith for us to get him. You see, believers and non-believers alike have a sense that there's more. We do. We know there's got to be something else going on. And when you take that step of faith, you begin to have that revealed to you exactly what it is. But God's made it all right in its own time. He's not hurried. He's not rushed in the accomplishment of His will. He moves slowly, methodically, purposefully. And I began to realize that my faith was being developed over time as well. That in slowing down and just trusting God step by step, day by day, my own faith was being developed and maintained, by the way. So slow down. Slow down. Allow the Lord to work on your faith. Wait on the Lord. Bible study, prayer, loving His appearing, these things require patience. And you know what develops patience, right? James chapter 1, verse 2, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. What do you need endurance for if it's a sprint? It's not a sprint. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So slow down. Verse 4. Speed up. Verse (laughs) 4. Wealth adds many friends, but a poor man is separated from his friend. Hmm. Skip down to verse 6. Many will seek the favor of a generous man or a noble man, someone who's got something to give. And every man is a friend to him who gives gifts. Verse 7, all the brothers of a poor man hate him. And how much more do his friends abandon him? And you know, it's hard to read that, but these are proverbial observations like we noted before. These are not the way it should be. These are the way it is in our world. It's just the way it is. Well, what then is the way of the Lord? Jesus says, quoting Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus stopped right there. The verse goes on, dealing with what he will bring in the second coming and the day of the vengeance of our God, but to comfort all those who mourn. See, that's God's way. The Proverbs we've just read there, that's the world's way. God's way is different. Verse 5, a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who tells lies will not escape. Skip to verse 9. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who tells lies will perish. Slight change in those two verses, but they're both saying basically the same thing. Solomon repeats a fundamental truth, almost word for word, except he says the first time, if you lie, you're not going to escape. And the second time, if you lie, you will perish. And this is no small thing. Revelation 21, verse 8 says, The cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Liar! (laughs) 
Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Why does Solomon repeat this proverb so quickly in a row, right here in the same chapter, so close together? Why repeat it? Because God would warn you, would warn me against hell. He doesn't want you to go there. Right? Where does, he, where does the Lord want you? With Him. In the place that He has prepared for you. Is preparing for you right now. That's where He wants us. It is love to warn. It is always love to warn. It is not love to surprise. And so God gives fair and just warning. Now in verse 8, we're kind of jumping around, but we've covered up till there. Verse 8 tells us, He who gets wisdom loves his own soul. He who keeps understanding will find good. Note this, he who gets wisdom, the word wisdom there in the Hebrew is leb. Leb. You've heard the word before, it's also translated heart. Or, sense. Sense is probably a good translation here. He who gets sense, heart, loves his own soul. Now, this is not talking about self-love, but self-preservation. And there's a big difference. He who gets wisdom loves his own soul. He who keeps understanding will find good, or literally he who preserves understanding will find good. Hebrews 10.39 tells us, We are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. And the man who would preserve his own soul, the man who loves his own soul, again, not self-love, but the man who cares about where he's going is going to preserve faith, is not going to shrink back, but is going to run with the Spirit of God. Remember, look at it this way. We are created... In the image of God, right? Well, God is triune. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are triune. Spirit, soul, body. So we have a... a, And there are other similarities, but but I find this one most fascinating. We are spirit, soul, and body. A, A trinity, if you will. And the best way, spirit, soul, body, the best way to preserve the soul is to lean to the spirit. Best way to take the soul down is to lean to the body. Or carnal, physical things. If you want to preserve the soul, the, the, you know, the essence of who you are, you want to preserve the soul, you lean to the Spirit. You listen to the Holy Spirit of the living God. You remain in the Word of God, washing the Spirit and soul. It's the best way to preserve the soul is to be sealed in the Spirit by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13 In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. What does that mean? It means if you give your life to Jesus, He seals your spirit. And then from there on out, what you want to do is feed the Spirit. Feed the Spirit. Feed the Spirit. It's just plain wisdom. Once a person is saved to preserve the soul by feeding the Spirit rather than the body, spiritual choices rather than carnal choices. It's the old axiom or or example of the the, the two dogs. Two dogs. You know, your spirit and your flesh are like two dogs. The one you feed the most is the one that will win. So feed the Spirit. You're doing that right now, by the way. Praise the Lord. You're feeding the Spirit, with the Word of the Spirit. One other thing about this before I go on to the next verse, preserving the soul, gang, is a day to week to month to decade deal. It is an ongoing deal. It is the walk of a lifetime. So stay with it. Stay after it. Don't stop. Well, I was, you know, I was into Bible study that one season of my life, and things are pretty good. You know, I... But I got busy, got some other stuff going on right now. I really don't have time to do it right now. Feed the Spirit. Feed the Spirit. Verse 10. Luxury is not fitting for a fool, much less for a slave to rule over princes. The first thing I thought of when I saw luxury is not fitting for a fool was lifetime of the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Robin Leach. Remember that show? What a stupid show. (laughs) And then MTV comes along along with cribs. Check out where I live. But you cannot. You know? And pimp your ride. 
going to do stuff to our cars now to make them. You know, it's just, really? Man, they're just feeding the, the flesh dog. That's what that's all about. <laughs> Luxury is not fitting for a fool. And you see this happen. Some people end up in a most luxurious life and their life falls apart. Because it's not based on anything. It's based on a hit pop song. Oh, that's impressive. You know? It's not based on substance, the substance of Jesus Christ. Much less for a slave to rule over princes. We're all equipped. We're all equipped for where we are in life. And I want you to think about that. We're, we're all given what we need to be in the place that God has put us. All right? Which means I have as much money as I can handle. <laughs> Not a penny more. And, and, you know, it's easy to get into that place of comparison, especially in the church, looking at those who have a little bit more and those who have less. No, 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 no. Look at it as God has us each one right where he wants us. And if we're following him in faith, then it really doesn't matter how big the house is or how many cars. or, or that, None of that matters in the family of God, Right? What matters is that we accept where we are and we trust Him for what He provides. And Solomon notes that some people are just un, unqualified or ill-equipped to deal with luxury and or authority. You know what Paul says? 1 Corinthians 7.20 Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. If you're able also to become free, do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Don't become slaves of men. Paul says it doesn't matter what your position is in the world. Just live out your position in Christ. You know? And that is another one that kind of blows a big hole in prosperity gospel teaching. It's not come to Christ and you're holy. You can enjoy the lifestyles of the rich and famous. No, come to Christ as you are and he will meet you where you are and he may keep you right where you are, but you will be free in a way you've never been before. Good stuff. By the way, don't become a slave to luxury either. The opulence of the glory of God is going to cause all earthly glory to pale. Verse 11. A man's discretion makes him slow to anger. And it is his glory to overlook a transgression. Skip down to verse 19. Listen to this. A man of great anger will bear the penalty, for if you rescue him, you'll only have to do it again. (laughs) These two verses depict a real godliness. In fact, a great aspect of the very character of God himself, and that is slow to anger. In Exodus 34, verse 6, he's giving his self-description, and that's part of it. Slow to anger. The Lord, the Lord, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. And so this describes God, and so to be slow of anger is to be like God. And by the way, this word overlook, it is his glory to overlook a transgression, is in the Hebrew, pass over. To pass over a transgression. Transgression, And we are never more godly than when we are slow to anger and when we pass over a sin against us. In the same way the Lord passed over the Israelites there in Egypt on the night that began, kicked off Passover. So we are like the Lord when we pass over sin that is against us. 1 Corinthians 13.5 Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love passes over. Verse 12. I like this verse. I have a circled, highlighted, underlined, and all of it. The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. This is a Jesus proverb. Because it so beautifully describes Jesus. All the proverbs come from wisdom, but this one describes him. King of kings, Lord of lords, lion of the tribe of Judah. And in the book of Revelation, if you've read it, if you've studied it, the opening chapter is phenomenal. John, on the island of Patmos, gets the revelation of Jesus. And and by the way, it's the revelation, not the revelations. It's not many revelations that the book is about. It is about Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ. One revelation, the revelation of Him. 
And John sees him in the first chapter, and he's absolutely blown away. Listen to the description, just part of it. Verse 14 of Revelation 1. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. Flaming eyes. Now, in the context of this verse, the king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. And the flaming eyes of Jesus do one of two things to you. If you're rebellious, they will bore right through your heart in judgment. But if you love Him, they will warm your heart in compassion. The flaming, fiery eyes of Christ. His eyes can kindle afresh your faith or fry your rebellion. The King's wrath... It's like that of a roaring lion. His favors like the dew on the grass. Verse 13. Verse 13. A foolish son is destruction to his father. And the contentions of a wife are a constant dripping. (laughs) This is one I have promised I will never quote to my wife. Ever. 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 Not smart. A foolish son is destruction. Literally a chasm. The implication is a foolish son sucks his father into his own problems, draws him into a pit, a pit of despair. (laughs) Sorry. I'm going to have to go home and watch The Princess Bride. And if you haven't watched it, you need to see that movie. Excellent movie. Clean, funny, great. Anyway, yeah, the foolish son draws the father into that chasm. But no, why, why does Solomon do this? He pairs this with a contentious wife. A foolish son and a contentious Wife, A chasm of a son and an annoying wife. Wives, hear me, and, and I'm not making any judgment about anyone, but constant dripping will only stress him out. If we have a word for it in our culture, nagging, yeah. And it doesn't work. It does not work. And especially if your husband is not a believer in Jesus, that is the absolute wrong approach. You're not going to go to church? Oh, you're just going to stay home and watch the football. Well, that's just great for you. I'm going to not going to be spiritual. You know? Drip, 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 drip. Remember the Chinese water torture? That's what he's talking about here. Drip, drip, drip. At first it's annoying. After a while it drives you nuts. You know? And so, but here's the problem. There's... Verse 13 is a dysfunctional family. The son is a fool. Because dad is not around to lead the son and to raise him up, probably because he doesn't want to be around his wife because she's such a nag. See? Everybody's involved in this mess. (laughs) I didn't get hit by a tomato. That's pretty good. We better go on. (laughs) But who is the victim of a contentious marriage? The foolish son is. The foolish son. So what can I do to rescue my teenager? I was asked several years ago. I gave a different answer than this verbally, but in my mind I remember what James Dobson said. You start when they're newborn. Because when it gets to the teenagers, the path is set. The die is cast. It's got to be when they're little. Skip down to verse 18. Listen to this. Discipline your son while there is hope and do not desire his death. (laughs) I am going to knock you into next week. I'm telling you now. Do not desire his death. I'm going to show you kingdom come. I brought you into this world. I will take you out. You know, you've heard all these. Don't desire that. Don't just wish that he'd go away. I'm fed up. I'm tired. You know, parenting is not easy. It is hard. And it's never over. It just isn't. That's the deal. When you step into it, parents, let me encourage you, if it's hard right now, to step back, take a deep breath, and ask for the strength of God to continue to love your kids, whatever age they are, wherever they are. But discipline, fathers, discipline your sons. Mothers, discipline your sons while there is hope. The idea is, again, you you start early. Start early. Verse 14. House and wealth are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. 
And this contrast, the dysfunction of verse 13, now we see the functionality of a healthy family in verse 14, a blessed son and a wise wife. I really like that. A prudent wife is from the Lord. And you know what? It's true. I have one. A prudent wife. A wife with a good degree of wisdom and understanding that, <laughs> that this dork needs from time to time. But check this out. It, it says, house and wealth are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. So you can get all kinds of good stuff as an inheritance from your earthly father, but what your heavenly father, gentlemen, what your heavenly father would give you is a good wife. A prudent wife. That's what God wants for you. She is a gift from the Lord. I, I think we should shift things around in wedding ceremonies. In fact, let's remind me, we've got to try this. Next time you do a wedding or I do a wedding, try this. Instead of saying, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And the dad says, this her mother and I do. Instead, have them say, the Lord does. Who gives the woman to the man? God does. She is a gift from the Lord. Husbands, your wives are a gift from the Lord. Verse 15, laziness casts into a deep sleep, and an idle man will suffer hunger. Very true. If you're tired, it's probably because you're not doing anything. That is the fastest way to get worn out. Try it. Next time you have a day off, get up in the morning, sit on the couch, and purpose to do nothing. And by noon, you'll be... You know, it's the greatest way to completely waste a day and exhaust yourself. Do nothing. Just lay around. But you know, the opposite is absolutely true. Exercise increases energy. Not last night, but the night before, I did not sleep. I mean, it was just... I, I, I had, a, <laughs> had a Diet Coke at about 11 o'clock. Bad move. It's all night long. <laughs> You know, it just it was painful. And the next day I had to study and I was exhausted. And Cheryl was going to the gym. Want to go to the gym? No, I don't want to go to the gym. I'm going to go to the gym. <laughs> All right, I'll go to the gym. You know, and the first 10 minutes on the elliptical were absolute terror. <laughs> you know? But it got better. And by the time I was done working out and got home, I was awake. I was energized. I was good to go. It was awesome. And it's absolutely true. So it's, it's a very true saying, laziness casts into a deep sleep, and an item man will suffer hunger, but it's not a physical proverb. Because if you read it literally, it is not an idle man will suffer hunger, but an idle soul will suffer hunger. He's talking about spiritual apathy. And the same principle holds true physically as spiritually here. If you want to be spiritually apathetic, don't do anything. Lay around in your spiritual life and you will find yourself just someone says, Hey, let's open the Bible. Let's go to worship. Spiritual apathy yields more spiritual apathy. Skip down to verse 24. I love this one. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish, but will not even bring it back to his mouth. (laughs) Can you just picture that for a minute? You you reach out to get the hot dog, and you're going... (laughs) (laughs) What a wonderful word. And yet, spiritually speaking, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You will be satisfied. It's not like sticking your hand in the dish and falling asleep doing it. You just, you cannot get enough. And that spiritual hunger and desire feeds more spiritual hunger and desire. And spiritual energy feeds uh, feeds spiritual energy. And you're good to go. I love that. And he, verse 16, who keeps the commandment, keeps his soul. Or preserves his soul. But he who is careless of conduct will die. And it's the same issue. I ran into Glenn at uh, 
at Thrive down in Oak Harbor this morning. And I really only got half my workout in because he talked to me the whole other half. So I, you know, I got that one machine going. But it's all right. It's all right. I'm just going to go when you're not there, Glenn. But no, I'm kidding. I mean, we had a great talk. And we're sitting there talking. And, and you remember the last thing I said to you when I left? Because it really hit me. I said, hey, physical workout this morning, spiritual workout tonight. Mm-hmm. You know? And so here we're getting that. And it is energizing. And it is exciting. And if you are feeling at all lethargic in your soul, if spiritually you're feeling apathetic, if getting into Bible study or doing personal devotions, it sounds tiresome to you, it's just the opposite. These things will energize your spirit. Paul says one of my favorite verses, bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds the promise for this present life and also for the life to come. 1 Timothy 4.8 Man, if you're going to work out, work out spiritually. Well, work out physically too, that's fine. But just in the same way you get energy from, from working out, you get spiritual energy from doing spiritual things. Yeah, but... But pastor, I just don't have time, you know, for daily devotions and Bible study. Do you know that in 15 minutes a day, 15 minutes, if you will read the Bible 15 minutes, start in Genesis and go all the way through Revelation, you will have covered the entire Bible in one year. 15 minutes a day. Do you have 15 minutes to work out for the Lord? I need an hour to go to the gym. 15 minutes. My grandmother bought our whole family the one-year Bible one year for Christmas. We read one-year Bible, and we started. And I read through that thing three years. Like it to be more. It was three. I don't have time now, but, you know. We're talking about a true spiritual energy here, and it comes from pursuing godly things. And if you feel like you don't have time for it, man, give it 15 minutes and just watch. It will expand. You'll find that you're giving yourself an hour because 15 minutes ain't enough. You need more. If you say, okay, I'm going I'm to start every day. I'm just going to pray five minutes. First five minutes I get out of bed, I'm going to pray before I do anything else. I guarantee you, a month later, if you are faithful to that, a month later you're going to be praying 20, 30 minutes. The next month, it may be an hour. Until you're like some church fathers who would say, and I forget the one, it may have been, may have been Martin Luther, but who used to get up three to four hours early on extremely busy days because he needed the time. And that's what happens with spiritual things. Verse 17. One who is gracious to a poor man, watch this, this is stunning, lends to the Lord. He will repay him for his good deed. I don't know how more blatant that could be. One who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord. But, but, but wait, don't other Proverbs say don't lend? Yeah. So lend expecting nothing in return. Give. Just give. Be gracious toward. Care for those who don't have what you have. Expect nothing back. And by the way, you will get payback from the Lord. Because he identifies, and I'm not sure I've seen another verse more explicit than this, where he absolutely identifies with the poor. Perhaps one. Matthew 25, 35, he said, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. A stranger you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. Sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. The righteous will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Matthew 25. By the way, Jesus is talking about Israel there. I won't get into that tonight. But he's talking specifically about Israel, even the least of these Jewish brothers of mine. But the point is this, if you care for those who don't have, if you love the poor, you are, in essence, feeding God. Okay, quickly, 
No, I'll save the story for another time. We've got to move on. Verse, let's continue on. Where are we? I know you probably wanted to hear that story. You don't even know what I'm talking about. It's okay. Verse 20. Verse 20. Listen to counsel and accept discipline that you may be wise the rest of your days. Many are the plans, or many plans are in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. Note this. It says you may be wise the rest of your days. It's literally you may be wise in your latter days. Toward the end of your life. Or, in the last days, we could say, do you want to be wise in the last days, in these last days in which we live? Then I would say to you, listen to counsel, accept discipline, the counsel of the Lord that will stand. What is the counsel of the Lord in the last days? Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time. Because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Paul said to Titus, chapter 2, verse 11, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. That's God's counsel for these latter days. For the last days in which we live. That's the way to live. Verse 22, what is desirable in a man is his kindness. And by the way, desirable is literally attractive. So guys... You want to be attractive. And I'm talking single guys, because married guys, it doesn't matter if you're attractive. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You want to be attractive to your wives? Okay. You know, better than sitting around burping and, you know, attractive. Anyway, what is attractive in a man is not his biceps, not his hairline. Thank you, Lord. It is his kindness or literally his loyalty. There are a few things more attractive to a wife than her husband's loyalty to her. And it is better to be a poor man than a... Say it. Liar! Right, okay, good. (laughs) Remember, remember this, gang. Fear God, fear God, and you won't fear anything else. Don't fear God, and you will fear everything else. Verse 23 is the fear of the Lord leads to life. Uh, so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil, or not visited by evil. So let me repeat what I said. Fear God, and you won't fear anything else. Don't fear God, and you'll fear everything else. Verse 25. Strike a scoffer, and the naive may become shrewd, but reprove one who has understanding, and he will gain knowledge, or literally discernment. I really like this verse. What it means, what it's saying is, in other words, the scoffer and the simpleton learns to avoid discipline. Okay? They learn to avoid it. Strike a scoffer and the simpleton or the naive may become wily, crafty, shrewd. Figure out how to not get in trouble again. But reprove one with understanding and he will develop discernment through it. He'll he'll grow. He won't do the same thing. See, the simpleton will do the same thing. They just figure out a way to do it and not get caught. But the wise person won't do the same thing again. They become discerning about what they have received reproof for. There is something for me to learn in every reproof. And so it's wise, even in criticism. No no one likes to be criticized, but when you are criticized, there is great wisdom in receiving it and saying, okay, Lord, what, what is in this for me? What do I need here? Verse 26, he who assaults his father and drives his mother away is a shameful and disgraceful son. I don't think there's anything I can add to that. Verse 27, cease listening, my son, to discipline and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Verse 27 is a difficult one to translate. Solomon may simply be warning to to not stop listening to discipline. That's the way it reads in the New American Standard Version. Uh, You know, maybe maybe his sons are getting a little tired. 
Maybe your sons are saying, Dad, we're at the end of chapter 19. Finish up already, you know. Maybe it's been a long night of teaching. So he's saying, sons, don't stop listening. Listen up. Or, or, and here's the King James translation of this verse. Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causes to err from the words of knowledge. It's either don't stop listening to the words of knowledge, which works, or it's stop listening to the words that would cause you to walk away from knowledge. That's absolutely critical. That's why we're saving verses 1 through 10 for Sunday morning. I think of colleges and universities that undermine truth. I think of even public school today where so many lies are being taught as truth. And Solomon would say, don't listen to it. Stop listening to the lies because eventually we start believing them. We start to say, oh, yeah, well, yeah, that's what that must mean. We'll talk more about that someday. Verse 28, a rascally witness. The word rascally, I love it. It made it into scripture. (laughs) A rascally witness makes a mockery of justice. And the mouth of the wicked spreads iniquity. Remember Cato Kalin? Anybody remember him? Remember the OJ trial? And OJ had the house guest who was living in his house at the time named Cato. Brian Kalin is his actual name, Cato. And he had kind of long hair, scruffy, surfer looking dude. And he got up on the stand, and it was just hilarious. It was hilarious. And I, I, he just popped into mind. A rascally witness makes a mockery of justice. And they, the, the whole thing kind of became a, a three-ring circus there for a while. And he was right in the middle of it. Good old Cato. By the way, he's a game show host now. I'm not sure why that's important, but in case you were wondering what he's doing these days. Yeah. I'm not saying Cato was necessarily wicked, but he was certainly a rascal and a good example of that. Let's finish. Verse 29. Judgments are prepared for scoffers and blows for the back of fools. Let me explain to you here how upside down the world is. Judgments are prepared for scoffers and blows for the back of fools. Judgments is literally rods. Rods. Instead, Jesus endured the rod. Instead, Jesus' back took the blows. The blows are for the backs of fools. The rod was for scoffers. But Jesus took them. He was wisdom incarnate, but on his back, he took the blows that belonged to the rest of us fools. He was pierced through, Isaiah 53 tells us, for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. And that is not the way it should be. It's not the way it should have been. Fools deserve it. We deserve it. Not Jesus. Not wisdom. But he took it. And I got to tell you honestly, and very seriously as we close here, when I hear people ridicule judgment or toss out hell saying, as I just heard yesterday, oh, we don't believe in heaven and hell around here. Center for Spiritual Living in Mount Vernon. Mm does not believe in heaven or hell. Rick, you just called him out. Yeah, I did. Because it's heresy. And because it's not scripture. And when I hear someone say, I don't believe in hell and judgment, I really wonder how that makes Jesus feel who took judgment and went to the depths. How do you think he feels? And how much severer punishment, Hebrews 10.29 tells us, do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? There is one offense, one offense that Jesus says is irreversible. 
He called it the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is defined to say Jesus is not who he said he was. One offense that is unforgivable, trample underfoot the Son of God. One offense that you will not recover from, and that is to cast aside Jesus and say, unnecessary, not immediately, you know, not not involved in me, not, I don't need him. Just, I don't need the Jesus stuff. There's no heaven, there's no hell. It's just, you know, you die and you go into transition. I don't even know what that means. (laughs) It's all bogus. You're trampling underfoot. The Son of God here insulting the Spirit of grace. And I remind you, the King's wrath is like a roaring of a lion, and His favor is like the dew on the grass. Which is it going to be? Which will it be for you? Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Are you looking for Him? He's coming. Father, bless your word to our hearts tonight. We covered a lot of Proverbs. I just pray we can take these in. Lord, I know over the next week, you will give us opportunity and time to to review these and to think about them and to pour over them. May we slow down in our lives enough to hear you and, Father, to take in all these things. Bless your word to our hearts. We praise your name, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen.